Hey, um, this is Kyle Tranmire, also known as Guante. I'm a poet. <laughs> I also work with True Art Speaks, a Minnesota-based arts and culture organization. And since 2014, uh, True Art Speaks has organized the annual Flip the Script Youth Writing and Performance Conference. Uh, this year, because of the pandemic, we switched up the format a little bit and are sharing some videos um, that can maybe have some life and you know be useful beyond just one like hour-long workshop. This video is on a topic that is very dear to me, which is writing for social impact. Um, obviously not all writing has to be about changing the world. Like sometimes you just got something inside you that, that you want to get out. Sometimes you write just to process what you're going through and like, that's okay. It doesn't have to be for anyone else. Um, it's all valid, but you know, a lot of us, especially coming from the spoken word community and, and the hip hop community, are really interested in that question of, you know, how can our values and our principles come to life in our art? Um, how can we represent for those who've come before us and speak out on issues that affect us and our communities? Um, how can we create art that moves people and or that meaningfully contributes to the work that is moving people? Um, those are deep, complex questions. <laughs> And nobody has all the answers to them. You know, what I'm going to share in this video, it, it's not a, like, here are the five keys to writing for social impact, right? It's more about questions. Um, I want to share five questions that I ask myself when I'm writing, um, when I'm trying to create art that, you know, grapples with political or, or social issues. These are not the only questions that someone could ask because, um, you know, we all approach this work from different angles. We hold different identities. We have maybe different goals in mind for our work. Um, I just want to share these five questions as a way to contribute to what has to be a larger conversation. And so I'm super excited to get to the more kind of down to earth questions about craft and technique, because I do think sometimes that this can become a, a fairly theoretical conversation at the same time, though. I don't think it's responsible to just talk about craft and technique. You know, if we want to write for social impact, for social change, there, there's some prep work to do. There's some other stuff to think about before we get, get to like the nuts and bolts of writing. So, I don't know. On that note, uh, the first question or like set of questions that I ask myself is about context. You know, who am I? Who is my audience and what is my role in speaking on this issue? You know, and those aren't questions that artists are always excited about asking. You know, we sometimes want our work to just be like this universal magical thing to, to just think about the art and not have to think about the space around the art. But, you know, think about this. The most persuasive or impactful art isn't just about making a strong political argument. It isn't even just about the, you know, wrapping up that argument in beautiful language or powerful metaphors or an image driven story. Um, persuasion is first and foremost about relationships. Um, you know, sometimes that's literal, right? Like if someone is performing and I know them and, and I trust them, then what they're saying is probably going to have a bigger impact on me than if they were a stranger. But I also think that notion of relationships is bigger than just, you know, people we literally know in real life. I think it points to the idea of the relationship that is built between writer and, and reader, between performer and listener, and how important it is for artists who care about making some kind of social impact to be intentional about all that. You know, so what does that intentionality mean in practice? You know, one concrete point could be acknowledging where and how people are going to experience the work. A poem that wins a poetry slam could very well crash and burn at a rally. Um, a poem that fundamentally transforms how somebody thinks about a particular issue might not ever be good enough to get published in like a prestigious journal or whatever. You know, the space matters, the, the target audience matters, and all that stuff informs how we approach the actual writing, um, or it can inform. <laughs> you know, and that points to maybe a, a, a deeper question about like the functions of poetry um, and how, you know, a, a particular poem can inspire it can educate, it can call to action, it can challenge a dominant narrative, it can create a public space to grapple with an idea, it can raise money for an organization, but you know, rarely does a poem do all of that stuff. Um, 
And so, you know, sometimes it can just be worthwhile to ask oneself, what is the work of this poem? Um, what would I like it to do? Even if the answer to that question is complicated, it doesn't always have to be like a linear thing. But again, it's just, you know, another question that is worth sitting with. Um, and, you know, the second big question on my list here is very much related to the first one in that it's also about context and audience and identity. And I think the vital question to ask is, what is my story to tell? If I choose to speak on a particular social or political issue, am I approaching it from my own perspective or am I trying to tell other people's stories for them? Um, for example, you know, if you think child poverty is a really important issue that more people should be talking about, but you have not experienced it yourself, um, there's a big difference between writing a like harrowing persona poem from the first person perspective of a hungry child and writing a poem about how you, as someone who is not a hungry child, came into consciousness around that issue. Um, or, you know, a more creative way to spotlight that issue that doesn't rely on someone else's story, um, especially someone else's pain and trauma. You know, one approach is exploitative and one approach ideally is, is generative. It challenges the audience to think about their own privilege in the context of that issue. You know, another example could be that, like, I don't think white people shouldn't write about race. I just think it's important for white people to grapple specifically with whiteness, with policing, with privilege, with reparations, and not just, you know, write the same poems or try to tell the same stories that, that writers of color are creating. Um, so let me share a few like examples. I want to make a list of poems throughout this video and we'll share the links to them at, at the bottom or whatever. Um, so a few examples that come to mind that illustrate kind of these first two points. Um, because of my own work, I think a lot about like how men talk about masculinity. Um, and so two poems that come to mind are uh, Rudy Francisco's The Heart and the Fist and Javon Johnson's Baby Brother. Um, both poems that don't point fingers out there at all like the bad people who are wrong, but turn the lens inward and explore the poet's own relationship with the issue. Um, another example is a poem that I've seen a lot, a lot of people share. It's um, Ilya Kaminsky's We Lived Happily During the War, which um, shows to me at least that there are more perspectives available to us, um, including our own real perspectives, um, than just the perpetrator of violence and the victim of violence. Of course, if there's an issue that you do have firsthand experience with, you know, that's, that's something else. But um, when we don't, what I'm saying is we can still explore issues from our own perspectives. We can tell our own stories. A million more things we could talk about here, but um, we'll keep it moving. The third like big question that I like to ask uh, is what's the hook? Um, this is somewhat related to the first two questions and that it, the idea isn't just like how brilliant or right you are. It's also about how the reader or listener will engage with the thing that you're brilliant or right about. And so real quick, um, in a song, the term hook, right, generally refers to the chorus, you know, the, the, the refrain, the part that gets stuck in your head. And I'm using the word a little bit differently here, but it's related. Um, my personal definition is about how hook is the concept. It's the organizing principle. It's the thing that makes your, you know, poem about the climate crisis different from all the other poems about the climate crisis. What makes it stick out? And, you know, we got to say a poem does not have to have a strong conceptual hook to be a good poem. Right. The hook doesn't make the art good, um, but art with a strong hook is very often like, at least for me, more memorable. Um, and when we're talking about social impact, that idea of like, how do you get something to stick in someone's head is, is kind of important. And so again, examples, I think about um, Patricia Smith's poem, Skinhead. I think about Dinez poems, Smith, uh, or Dinez Smith's poem, uh, Dinosaurs in the Hood. Um, Shane Hawley's Wile E. Coyote poem. A personal favorite of mine that you may or may not have seen is um, Christy Nami Erickson's If Racism Was a Burning Kitchen. And again, we'll share all, all these links below and I encourage you to, you to check them out. But these are all poems that have really good hooks, 
um, concepts that immediately draw you into the idea. Um, even using myself as an example, right? Like 10 responses to the phrase man up is not the best poem I've ever written, but it has a really strong hook. Um, that title and that like organizing framework resonated with people even beyond the actual substance of the poem. And so sometimes, you know, when I know what I want to write about, but, you know, I don't know how to start before I just dive in and start writing, I might stop. I might pump the brakes and just sit for a minute and think of, you know, five potential approaches to that issue or that topic. Um, because, you know, sometimes coming at a topic from a, just a different angle can be really worthwhile. Maybe making the poem a little weirder or more personal or just framing the poem in a different way uh, might help might help it stick in people's heads. Um, I just know that when I'm leaving a poetry slam or an open mic, I don't always remember the good poems or the best poems. I remember the most interesting concepts, um, the hooks. And again, this is something that relates to communication beyond poetry and beyond songwriting. This is about like writing in general. Um, you know, that's also true of the fourth question that I'm going to ask here, which is, how can I make this real? Um, and, you know, real is maybe a loaded term, but I'm thinking about the power that art has to take ideas and concepts and issues and turn them into stories, um, into stuff that we can close our eyes and visualize. Art can put a human face on an issue, right, or a social problem that is too often intellectualized or made abstract. You know, and I want to be very careful here. I'm not saying that every poem must literally tell a story or that I can only understand, you know, say racism if I hear someone's detailed first person account of experiencing it. I think that what this question is pointing at is something that's maybe a little more practical, just concrete language as a tool. Um, you may remember learning about abstract and concrete language in school, right? Maybe. Um, abstract language referring to like ideas and concepts like freedom and power and justice and love, right? Like love, you know what love is, but you can't touch it. You can't see it. It's like a, an idea, right? Whereas concrete language is anything that, you know, you can't see, hear, taste, smell, or touch. Um, and, you know, since most of the topics that we want to be writing about are generally abstract or abstract to most people. Um, you know, the climate crisis, right? Or economic inequality or whatever. Um, concrete language can be a way to make those abstract things come to life. And once again, I'm, you know, I wanna say, you don't have to only use concrete language to write a good poem. Um, but one thing I can say is that, you know, my own writing kind of fundamentally changed when I made the conscious choice to, to push myself to use more concrete language. Um, from starting a poem in my head with like, I think or I believe, to starting a poem in a scene, right? A concrete like moment in time when something is happening. Um, because, you know, I could write a poem about solidarity and, you know, <laughs> I could also write a poem about a specific moment from my memory in which the concept of solidarity really meant something to me. And then the work of the poem becomes not explaining to you or telling you what solidarity is, but it's just describing that scene, describing that, that moment, telling that story. Um, and the idea is that the audience then will make the connections to the bigger idea by experiencing that story. Um, and those connections will be stronger because they made them, them themselves. Right. So for more examples, I think about, you know, a classic example could be Whitey on the Moon by Gil Scott Heron. Um, I also think about one of my favorite poems, um, First Writing Since by Suher Hamad. Um, a more recent poem is also one of my favorites is Ode to Thrift Stores by Ariana Brown, like poems that use small stories to explore big ideas. Um, you know, feel free, feel free to share more in the comments. And so. The fifth and final question that I'll share, um, I think I'm going to cheat. It's not really a, a question, right? I'm just, I just wanted to share that I'm really interested in and appreciative of art that expands our imaginations. And I mean specifically our political imaginations. Um, art that tries to take things that are too often made invisible 
make them visible. Um, take things that are too often taken for granted and put them in the center spotlight, right? Um, it isn't the only function of art, but one thing that art can do is help us visualize like the future that we want to live in um, as a first step towards actually building it. So a million examples here, but ones that immediately popped to mind for me are a field trip to the Museum of Human History by Franny Choi, uh, which shows like a group of kids at some undefined point in the future who are at a museum learning about how people used to use prison and, and, and police to solve all their problems. And by describing that moment and that experience and that scene, the poem implicitly illustrates a world that has moved beyond that. Um, you know, even outside of poetry, there's this whole, there are rich traditions of like, you know, Afrofuturism and like using visionary and speculative approaches to writing in order to comment on what's happening right now, you know, from like Octavia Butler to N.K. Jemisin and beyond, beyond. And, you know, I love that science fiction approach, like the book I'm, I'm finishing up now is all science fiction and like I, I love that idea. But, you know, I think this point isn't just about, you know, robots and lasers, right? It's also, I think about a poem like um, 12 Reasons to Abolish CBP in Ice by um, Carlos Andres Gomez, right? It isn't taking that sci-fi approach, but it's still challenging us to expand our understanding of how an existing policy or set of policies is hurting people. Um, it's taking an abstract notion and putting a human face on it. So if you've only ever seen abolish ice as like a hashtag on Twitter, here's a poem that shows me what that actually means. Um, that isn't just saying, hey, this situation is bad, but by using that abolitionist framework and that abolitionist analysis challenges us to imagine a world different from this one. Um, and again, you know, everything that we're talking about here is tools, not rules. I love that. Tools, not rules, right? Um, a poem, you know, it, with this final point in mind, a poem doesn't have to be visionary to be valuable. Um, sometimes the work is just telling your story um, and the implicit political act that that is. Um, sometimes it's just describing something bad, even if you don't have the answer or even if you don't have some specific call to action. Like, that's also valid. Um, that's also important. All the stuff I'm sharing in, in this list, all these questions are just things to think about. And, um, you know, I'd love to hear what other people think about these points or if there are questions that you ask yourself when you're writing, you know, a political poem or a, a poem with social impact in mind. Um, so please feel free to share more thoughts in the comments. I'll end this video with, with just one more thought. When I think of the most powerful, impactful art that I've experienced, I think it's worth noting that there aren't a lot of big names on that list. Um, and it goes back to the very first point, which was about relationships. Um, the artists I know who have really been able to make a social impact, um, however we want to define that, um, are very often not super famous and very often didn't make that impact just through their art. <laughs> um, artists in general, I believe, have a lot more to offer movement work than just writing poems and songs about the issues. And yeah, I think we should write poems and songs about the issues. That's a good thing. But it doesn't have to be the beginning and ending of our, you know, relationship with movement work, of our involvement. Um, some of the best organizers I know are artists. And, you know, a last resource that I'll share then in the, the links below is just a, a link to a little zine that I helped create on getting involved in activist work for the first time, whether or not you identify as an artist, right? So if, if that's something that's new to you or if you're interested in learning more, like check that out. You know, for me, I think the best art, political or otherwise, just the best art doesn't come from locking ourselves in a cabin and focusing on nothing but our art, right? I think it comes from really engaging in our communities um, and being involved in struggle in ways that may or may not involve our actual art. Um, so I hope that can be useful. Um, thanks for watching. And again, I would love to, to read what, what you think, other thoughts, other questions, other ideas, other examples. Feel free to share them all in the comments. And 